to fulfill our Simpsons quote requirement for the episode, we did like 10 takes and that was the best one. <laughs> <laughs> So hello everybody, uh, welcome to OpenCV weekly webinar. Today we have with us Chris Nogic, who is one of the participant. In fact, he made it to the top 10 of OpenCV Spatial AI competition in 2022. And he'll talk about his journey of creating this submission, which involves a smart AI, AI conveyor belt. So welcome, Chris. I will give you a, a, an opportunity to introduce yourself in greater detail. But before that, let me just go over to Phil Nelson, who is the director of content at OpenCV. Hello, Phil. Yeah, good morning, Satya, and good morning to our audience here live from the internet. It is I, once again, the co-host with the co-most, the second banana who is second to none, your plus one and only, the next best thing, Phil Nelson. And I am here to remind you of a couple of things we do every single week here on OpenCV Weekly Webinar one of which is a special giveaway to you in the audience. One lucky winner later in the episode will get a chance to win $200 worth of Microsoft Azure credits from our dear generous sponsors at Microsoft Azure on blazing fast Intel hardware. We're also taking Q&A from you in the audience. So use that little Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you're not in Zoom, you can get into Zoom by going to opencv.live. That's http colon slash slash opencv.live. That'll give you a chance to participate in the giveaway and in the Q&A. Um, that's it, Satya. All right, so thanks for the introduction and let's uh, move over to Chris. And Chris, uh, please start with a little introduction and then we'll go over the project that you created which made it to the top 10 of uh, the competition. And you were also, well, congratulations that you were, uh, you were one of the teams that was single, you know, a single person was the team which is obviously very difficult, but congratulations on that uh, as well. So uh, yeah. take it over. Thank you so much, Satya. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, it, it was a, a challenge, especially it was one man band. Um, I will elaborate on this later on, but uh, uh, hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here. It was a, it's a great honor to be invited here. Um, I'm, as, as already was said, I'm Chris Nogic. I work and live in Poland. Um, I deal, I, I work in a consultancy uh, every day uh, dealing with Microsoft products, but uh, I am personally involved in uh, machine learning, advanced data analytics and computer vision. I do also Internet of Things uh, projects. And um, uh, yeah, let me, let me share the, the screen with the presentation about the journey I made for the 2022 competition. Looks good. Uh, is it is it uh, visible? Yep. Yep. Everything looks good. Okay. Yeah, so this is I already said that. So this is this is uh, uh, this is me. And uh, the, the project I worked on was the smart conveyor belt operated by computer vision and the AI algorithm AI models. And the project origin was um, the scenario is taken from the geological mining industry. I personally am not involved in mining or, or geology. However, I have a good friend that, that is a geologist who kind of get me interested in this kind of theme. Um, basically, uh, it is about selecting different minerals from the mining output. So basically, when you when you pick up ore from the uh, from under the ground, you have to select or sort of categorize different kind of rocks because usually the rocks are not all the same. They, they, they need to be somehow uh, selected and the rubble should be discarded and also maybe categorized to some, to some classes. Um, uh, Chris, uh, if you don't mind, can I interrupt a little bit? Um, yeah. So before we go into the project, I think uh, the audience would love to know your journey because you did not start out as a computer vision um, uh, you know, a, a person just a few years back, you were uh, a front end web developer. How did you make your journey from how did you? It's almost like a career switch that you made, which, uh, you know, we, we tell our uh, audience that that's entirely possible. A lot of people do that, and AI is taking off in a really big way. And this is your chance to actually 
um, you know, catch the rocket ship while it's taking off. It looks like you actually did the transition. So people would love to know your journey when you started and how you got into the field. And, yeah, it's not, okay, it's sure. not even, uh, I, I think it's sometimes necessary to, to pivot, you know, to change with the times, right, Satya? I think, yeah. uh, go ahead, Chris. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I used to be, uh, I started from databases a long time ago. And uh, for many, many years, I was a front end developer. So basically programming jobs, um, web page design, and then web application design. Uh, also a little bit of backend made in PHP, made in Node. Uh, but usually most of my work was, was JavaScript related. And we created lots of different projects for for the front end design. And then in, in time, I just got a little bit tired with it because there, was, there, were, there were just new frameworks appearing. There's so much competition also in this, in this field, uh, especially here in Poland. And then I, I decided to look for something else. And because I have a background in databases, also my education was from economy, statistical, econ econometry, and uh, all of these, all of these uh, sort of came together and met again in the machine learning ideas or machine learning field. So I think it was nine, uh, 2017 or 16 where I started to, to discover uh, the machine learning concepts. Um, first, it was purely numerical. So uh, anomaly detection, um, finding some, so some binary, binary decision and, and things like that. Back then, there was no, there was no cl computing cloud, no Azure that you could, for example, run some sophisticated models uh, in in the cloud and and calculate something biggish. Uh, you had to do everything on your own somewhere, maybe in your company, or you need to buy Gosh, some graphic. What a horrible time before Microsoft Azure existed. I can't <laughs> imagine. I can't imagine what that was like, even. Yeah, what I what what I'm aiming at is that you couldn't do computer vision models back then because it was simply too compute heavy. And uh, with with the with the growth of these services, you basically could do a lot of things by yourself and make a lot of fun of it. And if you do some projects by yourself, even for fun, you get this knowledge, and then you you can you can you know hook up with some actually real real life projects, right? Real, yeah. real companies. And everything and you've so been working as a consultant so you had the chance of bidding for some of these contracts is that correct yes yeah well normally i before before i worked in the company right now i i used to be a, a freelancer and i was actually that's right i were i was bidding i was uh, maybe let's say competing for different uh, uh projects and this this uh, addition that i had on top of my front-end offer with some uh, AI-related or machine learning-related services, like, for example, the engine for, for calculating clients' preferences, you know, or analyzing the movement on the web page was always giving me a little yeah. bit of the edge over the competition. Even though the, the, the models then, a couple of years ago, they weren't they're, they're so advanced as they are today, right? Right. But... Um, yeah. It's actually interesting to come back to these projects and see how it changed, how the technology changed since like three or four or five years ago and how much better you can do right now the same, you can, how better you can address the same problems right now. Yeah. It's also uh, like for people looking for, you know, career advice, I tell them that uh, there is a very asymmetric uh, effect of a slight edge. So you may be just 10% better than uh, other people, but you will get all the contracts or you will get all the work because you are 10% better, right? It's almost like, uh, you know, in swimming, for example, in Olympics, um, Michael Phelps wins by less than a second, but that right. little edge, he gets all the gold, right? Um, right. Uh, so, so that's actually true in the marketplace. Also that slight edge, when you acquire skills and you get that slight edge over others, it has a disproportionate effect on uh, the outcome, uh, so that's uh, something I little. Well, I just wanted to put it put it out there. So now we and can. Also, uh, yeah. What is what is funny is that well, 
the the machine learning or the AI project they have wow effect. <laughs> yes. So if you yeah. if you if you if you showcase them, they they also get usually get much more attention. That's true. That's they, true. they play a lot better in meetings. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Okay. Let's continue with uh, the slides. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we started from uh, the idea to make the conveyor belt that actually a, a intelligently selects selects the proper um, objects, proper kinds of rocks, and they discard the rubble. And then the the idea was to select or or sort the remaining output, the remaining rocks to particular classes that that they were defined. Um, the idea about the background of it is that uh, the mining industry is not so advanced. The oil industry, for example, is very, very uh, aware of advances. They, they invest a lot of in technology, but mining industry is not really so uh, advanced. And actually, if you compare the, these pictures from 50, 50, uh, 1556 and 1915, how they sort out the, the output, and now, how they sort of the output, it's not really much uh, of a difference. The ventilation has changed. Yeah, the ventilation has changed. The, yeah. Yeah, but, but uh, it, the you know, the, the country same. is, is, is irre irrelevant, but it usually looks, looks very similar in, uh, nowadays. So, um, so the idea was to take out the rocks, and I got this huge pile of rocks. To straining, select, straining to not make an Upton Sinclair reference here. Uh, I just did, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, and I got this uh, pile of rocks to to select. We have three classes, so we have pebbles, we have basalt rocks, and we have quartz rocks. Uh, rocks. But it uh, quickly turned out that they um, there were some problems with with creating a data set for for training the model. Uh, first of all, the data was skewed in a way that we don't have the same amount of pebbles like the same amount of quartz. So basically, we couldn't really train the model properly. And the number of these rocks were not really uh, large. It was like below 100 uh, each. And the pebbles were like 300. And the quartz were like five, maybe 50 or 60 because they are, they are more difficult to obtain. Uh, also, the problem turned out later on, where I actually constructed the model, the, the Lego model, the, the problem was the size. The, the strokes were simply too big to put on a conveyor belt, and they was, they were, the, the distance to the camera was too close, and basically they were too heavy and everything. So, to make long story short, uh, after creating a couple of interesting models and struggling with the models for rocks, we switched, or I switched to, to Lego blocks. So from rocks to blocks, basically we selected a couple of um, a couple of um, pieces that they were different classes. So whether they're bricks, they're squares, and the wheels, on, or, or similar. Um, so the goals were to build a real rep replica of moving conveyor belt, which was actually uh, have a different speeds and and you know have a continuous work. Um, the other goal was to remove unwanted objects from the belt. Uh, and then the remaining objects that were not removed were should be sorted by diverse classes. And they were basically taken away in a different in different directions. Apart from that, we could we wanted to count objects within classes and estimate volume of the objects for, for each class. So using the spatial capabilities of the uh, of the cameras. I think, uh, so if I could interject for one moment here about the goals there, I think a lot of people underestimate the, the importance of being intentional about your goals at the beginning of a project like this. It's really easy to think, oh, I'm just going to make a conveyor belt, right? It's, you know, it's not, not a big deal, but uh, I like that you, you laid out very specific and concrete items here because Otherwise, it could just spiral out of control and just you end up with a half finished, never finished project versus this very cool, uh, completable thing. And it's because you were in, uh, partly because you were intentional about your goals from the beginning of the project, and which is great to see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important because uh, I also wanted to make another. You could also actually make more more ideas and more goals to it, but uh, because of the time constraints, you have to also be realistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Constraints uh, matter. Yeah. 
Um, so the toolbox, the the uh, as most of the I think most of the teams use the same Lego set. It's Mindstorms Robot Inventor Kit. Then I got two uh, Laxonis OD Live cameras, uh, spatial cameras, and then from the software stack it was Azure Virtual Machines Custom Vision um, service from Azure, uh, RoboFlow for annotation and uh, and uh, augmentation of images, and then the Python and Mindstorms uh, Python library for creating the actual app uh, to run the conveyor belt and to control it. Um, so, I would, to, I would, if I can pause again real quick, the uh, I know before the, we started the show in the green room here, we were talking about the everybody that participated in the contest is aware of this, but there was some really difficult uh, times sourcing Legos at the beginning of this uh, mm -hmm. build phase of the contest. And, and Chris, you had a, a funny story about how you actually got yours. Would you, would you like to recount this for the, for the audience here? Yeah, well, it's kind of funny, but you know, usually you, you start to, the easiest solution sometimes works best, but you know, you, when you start to, after I figured out, I got the, got the info that I won this, um, I got selected for the for the competition. I started to look for this set, and it was uh, absolutely nowhere online to get it. It was sold out everywhere, and I even saw some private auction on the local auction uh, service, which somebody was selling this four times as much <laughs> wow. because because of the shortage. <laughs> yeah, part of the US, reason was also because was like of COVID. Thousand. Because of COVID, people were uh, probably, uh, you know, staying at home and therefore uh, they want this thing for their kids. That could be one of the reasons why it was sold out. We had not anticipated this. It caught us uh, a little bit by surprise yeah. that yeah. Legos would not be available. Right, right, right. So after like looking for maybe a week for this, I simply happened to be in this mall, a huge mall. There was this uh, Lego store, which was a tiny, tiny Lego store, and they had two on the shelves. They were just standing and looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I just got it and just walked away, you know. Paid it's like you, it's like you found a like a nugget of gold in the mall, <laughs> just in a <laughs> random random booth. Yeah. And I was just walking there like, what, what, what's, what, I, what I should do? And I just stared from the alley and it was just there on the shelf, staring at me. So, yeah. Okay. Did, did you hear music in your, did, did time slow down and you heard Uh-oh. music? Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and right. your faith yeah. in God was restored. <laughs> yeah, right. It was like, you know, you know, my heart was like up. Completely. Right. So, yeah. Uh, it would be like, I, I would hate to tell you, like, I don't do it because I don't have Legos. And it would be really silly. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, uh, that was the prototype, actually, <laughs> that I pitched <laughs> the project with uh, on the, on the, for the selection. And it was made with the Lego City. And here are the, like, three images of the stages that it was built. So first, from the left is basically a conveyor belt run by the engine and the hub, and then there is a, this this green this green thing is the pusher which pushes the the unwanted objects off the conveyor belt. Then the second stage was the a sorter spoon, which was a rotating engine uh, that was catching objects falling from the conveyor belt and then just tossing it off in a different places depending on the object class. And then finally on the right, right image, there, is, uh, there are basically holders for the camera. Um, there are two cameras, one for object detection and then one for object classification. Mm, yeah. So the final model looked more or less like, like this. We used 85% uh, of bricks <laughs> from, from this set. All four engines plus the lights that uh, made uh, that was running under the cameras to make the recognition better or more effective. Then two oak, two oak uh, the light cameras, and it took about two weeks work to combine it all together with the help of my son. 
who had uh, fun, you know, creating different kinds of uh, compartments for cameras and different wheels and stuff. <laughs> so, I heard he had fun taking it apart too. <laughs> yeah, because we were so tired afterwards, you know, after three months of running this all over again, and we were so tired, and, and then finally it was taken, uh, when, when the contest was finished, then it was just taken away in a half to create something else because it was so boring to have it for three months. So, <laughs> the same, yeah. Makes sense, yeah. Um, okay, the AI model, uh, the image, uh, we took about um, a thousand image images. Of, okay, we, uh, we took about uh, 1,000 objects were, were photographed, okay? Uh, the, the, I mean, the Lego blocks. How did then you um, acquire the images? Well, I have a lot of Lego blocks. I mean, I we we, we have like tons of of Legos, but not Technics, just the regular ones from the city. And I just uh, uh, I just took this whole bucket and put it on the ground and selected different classes, like those those bricks and those squares and the barrels and the wheels and everything and. Uh, there, there was many of them, and we did different angles, and so we had about, I, it's, it's not 1,000, but I think 900 photos, just the raw, pho raw photos, then they were annotated, and then we augmented them. So uh, then it was trained on the MobileNet V2 uh, network uh, for the transfer learning, and then the test models, um, especially the test models first with the rocks and then test the first early mo models with the bricks were made with or trained with Azure Custom Vision, which uh, this is a tool that I personally very like very much because it's very fine tool for accelerating building projects at the early stage. You can really test it very quickly. Uh, you know, you see what works. If there is not enough data from from one category, then you add. You know, you just you just generate those models on daily basis, and a custom vision is very quick to, to to do it. Then you can export it directly to OpenVINO from the Azure Custom Vision, and then you can convert it to the blob. Um, Could you um, explain a little bit uh, about you know? Uh, most people may be thinking of Azure as a service that you get a, a machine on the cloud. Could you tell a little bit about uh, Azure Custom Vision for people who may not be aware what you can do with uh, Azure Custom Vision? Yes. Um, so Custom Vision is, uh, uh, you're right, the Azure is pretty much mostly known from the virtual machines and yep. databases that you can put on the on the in the cloud and, and use them but azure also gives you a lot of um, services that are that are ready to ready to go i mean they, they they operate like a normal application that you would run but you run it on the cloud in the browser and then azure custom vision in particular allows you to uh, upload um, images, you can uh, you can tag them, you can uh, annotate them. Uh, I'm not sure if you can augment them there. Uh, I use I was doing uh, augmentation with RoboFlow, but uh, uh, with Custom Vision, you, uh, with Azure Custom Vision, you can definitely uh, annotate all the pictures. And they have couple of uh, couple of um, pipelines ready for you to create certain model. For example, object detection model, classification model. They keep adding those these models yeah. from time to time. Yeah. The, the, this tool is being upgraded once in a while. And uh, the thing is that you don't have to run any virtual machine additionally to this. Basically, you, you, you just click on the button, you get the trained model. You know, it just gets trained and there is the virtual machine underneath, definitely. But you don't really care about this, and you—it's it's very cheap tool as well for, for especially for those early made models which don't require too much compute power. Yeah. you can create them like on a conveyor belt. <laughs> you know, just, right. Just so, uh, how much um, do they charge only for the time uh, you the model was being trained? Um, so that would be a good feature as well, right? When uh, if you're not paying for the additional time beyond what the model was using. Um, yeah. 
yeah okay yeah okay. Well, you can yeah this is um i was say, I would say pay as you go no it's uh it's a different it pay as you use or something like this this the, yeah, okay. Okay. only pay for the usage of the actual usage computer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah you don't you don't pay for for the and the, there is no fixed fee to use the 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 um uh, interface or anything interesting and what about the time how much time did the training take uh after you upload the uh, data, how much time did the training take? Uh, it took less than an hour, I think. Oh, so that's, to, yeah. To, to pretty quick. Uh, I think this, this tool is pretty much scalable. So if, if there is a lot of, a lot of, um, um, a lot of uh, images, like the huge amount, then they probably run a better machine underneath. So to, to get a better Right. A better, so they are um, using their own pre-trained pre model, and then uh, they are fine-tuning using uh, your data, and probably also using uh, GPUs in the back end. Because uh, if they are returning the results in one hour, uh, then you know um, they must be using uh, the GPU as well as uh, a pre-trained model. Yeah. yeah, for a thousand yeah. images to be that quick, it's got to yeah. be some kind of beefy, beefy hardware there in the back end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, when I was using this custom vision service for other projects, I, I could, for example, get the model in six or eight uh, hours. So it depends on the on the complexity. Uh, right. There is a couple, as far as I remember, there is a couple of, of uh, pre-trained models uh, to select there when you when you uh, uh, when you customize and put settings to the to to build your own model, you can choose the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these were the test models. And then when I just figured out what was the best, uh, what was the best, what works best, then I eventually switched to notebooks. And uh, Luxonis gives a lot of nice demos on their web page uh, to use their cameras. And then I simply, uh, um, I ran the, the best machine that, that I could with the with the subscription that was available that was made available to us to, to all teams, uh, which I think was D4S um, running on Intel processor, and then I, we could run, run notebooks and then basically create models with the notebooks provided by Luxonis with some modifications that I needed. Um, so the final model was com was computed on uh, within in Python with with uh, the notebook and converted for blobs to the AI platform to the camera. Yeah, it's it's best to ask for. So when we when we negotiate with uh, Intel and Microsoft, the things uh, on the back of my mind is always, what are things that cost very little to them, but it will be very useful to our uh, to our participants, right, uh, contestants. So mm -hmm. the Azure credits. That's you know even if they give you five hundred dollars worth of Azure credits, it doesn't mean that it costs Microsoft five hundred dollars, right? So that asymmetry is uh, very interesting because you know they can give a lot of the, those credits, and it would be very useful for us without them costing real money. Yeah, we exactly. try to get optimized for most bang for everybody's buck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Exactly, and uh, the, the thing is that because you get those credits, you can actually use everything you want. Well, there are some restrictions, of course. You cannot run like super, super powerful machines, although it wouldn't make sense anyway because they would probably eat up your, your budget in like yeah. half a day or something. Yeah. Right. But, but uh, you can basically choose what you, what you need, what you, what you feel most comfortable working with, and um, that's what we did as well. Um, yeah, so the, the, the model was, uh, uh, was done. Then the brain teaser, the challenges that, that I had during this. So except for, I never built with techniques before and never used Oak Delight before. Um, that was a, a, a primary challenge to actually get accustomed to, to, to this new, uh, tools, uh, so, so to speak, uh, then the limited Python library, I will come back to this a little bit later. Um, the, if you want to connect Python or make a sort of application running with the Legos, you have to have a library that, that kind of operates on the Lego hub. And there is, there is, there is a few options, people, people do it. And um, the Pybricks seems like a good alternative. Uh, Pybricks is a 
is a platform for programming Legos, not only Mindstones, but different sets as well. And it's so good, obviously, that even Lego gave up their own platform and they recommend Pybricks to, to actually, they recommend Pybricks to people to, to use it for programming. However, there is a, there is a, a, a catch in this because with Pybricks, you have to actually update the firmware of the Lego hub. So they, you have to actually put some, their own software to the Lego hub to be able to run the Pybricks. And I was very afraid to do it because um, I do some IoT stuff in my life. I, I do it quite often. Uh, I do some little you know, gimmicks that measure temperature or, or, or do something or measure volumes or something. And I, I have bricked a couple of devices in my life completely. And this one, uh, this one really says Pybricks. So that's even more yeah. scary. It would be it would be it will be silly to brick Lego bricks <laughs> or Lego Lego hub brick. <laughs> yeah, you can't fail much but, harder than bricking a brick. <laughs> yes, exactly. So normally when I do an IoT stuff, I buy three things at least. So three three units of the same of the same uh, device, for example, so that I feel comfortable if I fry one of them or fry the second. I always have a backup. But as you as I said earlier, we didn't have an opportunity. Uh, or the we didn't have uh, possibility to actually replace if I if I break the hub I couldn't buy a spare one because it wasn't available due to these shortages that we that we heard about so I didn't want to use five bricks um, because of this um, but there was another uh, library that was made by a one developer from Israel which was Mindstorms library which was very good which was working very well the only problem was there was no callbacks in, in, incorporated in this library so I, I wouldn't know if the engine stopped running or I didn't know the result of the event right I will come back to this a bit, bit later um, the belt speed limit is because I couldn't uh, investigate i couldn't get the idea the information when of the state of the engine because of no callbacks i had to run the, the belt really slow so that the all of those spoons and pusher and pushers basically managed to do everything in their time i i couldn't make, make any modifications in belt speed limit uh, Hardware issues. Uh, unfortunately, one of two, actually both of my cameras were were faulty in terms of they were overheating and they were replaced by Luxonis pretty fast. But uh, I I think I spent a week or or a week and a half just fighting with this. I didn't know. I thought I was doing something wrong with the code, which causes the the camera to overheat. But it turns out it were they were uh, they had some uh, hardware problems, but they were replaced pretty quickly. That was it was yeah. There a, was a as you had mentioned before, there was a batch uh, in which we had, there was a bad batch yeah. in which we, has, we had up to 10% failure and um, you just- I was lucky not to get built. <laughs> yeah, Both unlucky with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unwanted detections, uh, that's actually, I will come back to this later. Uh, the vibrations, because of the engines and the movements of the, of the engines, the, the whole, uh, the whole model was vibrating a little bit, which caused problems with the focus of the cameras. And because they were vibrating, um, the the object detection wasn't like they had problems catching it at the first go. Uh, so I had to. It was actually very interesting because that was solved um, in a pure engineering method. So we have to redo the way the belts and bolts are connected, and then then the vibrations were simply spread differently throughout the model and then on top could of you, that, uh, 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 having not tried this myself uh, could you actually put the camera on the lego set itself so that it also shares the same vibration or uh, that would not have worked uh, yeah well that was actually the the camera were were held in within the compartments within the same um, Okay. Uh, it was still on the movie. The, the, it was all one one entity, basically, right. and the cameras were were placed there. Yeah, and the programming challenges. Uh, calculate moment of pusher action. Um, basically, it's when the when the object 
runs under the camera. It's being detected here, but it can be detected in the beginning of this yellow field or in the middle or in the end. So basically we have to calculate the moment where the where the this yellow arm, this sorry green arm, pushes the uh, the right exact right, right moment where the where the arm is pushing the the object uh, uh, away from the from the belt, and that was uh, because of the very nice capabilities of this camera that gives you a spatial coordinates uh, x and y. It was quite easy to actually catch the the moment the the place where the object was detected, and then by the simple formula, because we have a constant speed of the belt, we could detect the time needed to um, the delay needed before the actually detecting the model, detecting the object, and pushing it off from the from the um, from the belt. Um, then the spatial measurement, as I said on the goals page, we wanted to have, or I wanted to have the also to calculate the volume of the of the mining output, so to speak. But in in this uh, in this case, uh, the volume of the bricks. But it turned out that the camera, the OD light, doesn't really get the spatial, the, the Z dimension, the Z coordinate right within such a small distance from the object. So the yeah. optimal, the optimal uh, distance should be like 40 centimeters. We had only 12. So, as yeah, you so can there see is a minimum here, distance. There are two things going on, actually. There is a minimum distance that uh, the camera needs to be placed at which uh, you know de depends on the baseline etc but uh, also the th there's a second factor also when the things are very smooth and uh, same colored there is no texture then uh, you know its uh, performance would suffer because it's a stereo matching problem uh, which uh, does poorly when it is a solid colored object <clears throat> yeah, yeah 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 which would be well, solved well, in the newer versions in the newer versions uh, we are using both stereo as well as uh, you know uh, projection based methods where uh, something would be projected onto the scene so that uh, even when the surface is plain it can get uh, the texture and uh, recover the depth and so by both something things. you mean lasers that's right <laughs> mm -hmm. well that's that that's interesting well as you can see here uh, regardless of the color of the brick, basically the, the distance is a little bit too small to get the Z coordinates quite right. Mm -hmm. The X yeah. and Ys are all right, yeah. but the Z is, as you see, it's 421 millimeters, which is obviously wrong. Yeah. So um, I um, I saw that other teams because initially I thought that the whole the whole project should be built with the Legos. I got this understanding of this, but I saw other teams they they had like wooden frames. Right, different things like uh, placed over, for example, the, the Lego model. Yes. So the solution here would be basically to have a, like a wooden frame and position the camera a little bit further from the belt. And yeah. then it would probably yeah. work. That's right. Um, other than that, you know, the camera, the camera is working perfectly with the actually real size, the, the real life objects. The, the Lego blocks are really tiny. So basically this is not really a, 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 the best use case for, for uh, spatial uh, detection. Um, so that was a challenge. And then the, the callbacks, and you see the, the example here, the, the callbacks would be useful, for example, when if I knew uh, exactly when the engine is back, then it wow. wouldn't happen like this. For example, right. I would stop, I would exactly know how to operate the belt to be able to uh, keep all the blocks in the movement, right? Not to lose any. Yeah. Um, but because of no callbacks, I, I just had to do a sequential programming, which is a very, you know, old-fashioned way of a very <laughs> just wait, way of keep waiting for a long time. Uh, yeah, waiting or basically manually placing the blocks in a in a in a fixed duration that I know that the the engine would suffice and right. manage to come back to its initial position. And uh, by the way, the, the first, I, I skipped the um, unwanted detections here, like the third from the, from the bottom. Here you can see that the, the, the sorter spoon is basically all glued, all filled with the paper. Uh, that is because um, 
this is something I didn't expect, but it's obvious that if I made a model based on Lego bricks, but the Lego bricks are very much the same, and the model was actually detecting the bricks that were the, oh, the, the, the it's, de was it's detecting itself right. essentially. Yeah, it's detecting itself because they are so the convolutional network is based on detections of those tiny edges and everything. And right. it's obviously that the Lego blocks needs to be alike because they, they kind of attach to each other. So they right. need to be alike. So at first I was really struggling like how to solve this. I, I increased the number of images, but that didn't help at all. I started to also, I, I toyed with the idea to put the techniques blocks in the model so that I could skip those for some somehow. Yeah. That really didn't work, and it really like it seemed like a tedious task. Yeah. But the simplest solutions work best, you know. If you put some paper everywhere, <laughs> yeah. And basically, the camera was looking at the blank. Um, the, the the camera field of view was filled with blank paper, blank spaces. So yeah, and it it helped. Right. The other approach could have been uh, to use motion because the the setup is not moving and uh, the objects are moving that could have uh, helped potentially but the solution is way simpler way nicer actually more robust than using motion but it was actually detecting also the pieces of the spoon that is that was moving as well oh okay, okay. well never mind yeah it's yeah. it's uh, it's a funny funny thing so eventually we had a, a final result um um this is the part of the movie of that I as a, as a submission that I made for for the competition. So basically, the the prototype was working. I was quite happy with this. Not everything was uh, as I expected. I I was especially looking forward to doing some uh, autonomous maybe uh, pieces of autonomous operations. So for example, if the belt would stop if there was too many blocks on the belt so that would suffice and manage to to take care of each each, each and everyone but in order to um, avoid the i love lucy problem of uh you know things keep coming down the belt and it's going too fast yeah. and yeah yes 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 that was uh, i was hoping to to be able to do this but uh yeah considering the fact that i finished this five minutes before midnight then i'm happy <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy that it's uh, it kind of it proved the 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 idea. It, it can be done, and um, and yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun to do this. So um, the the actually the the, the app is uh, calculating uh, the number of classes. You can select which one to discard to to push off the belt, and then the the quantity of each block is here calculated if it's the barrel a brick or bumper or wing and um yeah and it's kind of works really nice that's really I nice i think it would make an impression if we had these rocks actual rocks there but <laughs> excellent cinematography on this video i just want to yeah point that yeah out. That, that's another piece uh the presentation the final presentation was very compelling thank you well yeah yeah I, I had fun shooting this in the last weekend. And um, yeah, we had to do this paper thing because it was it was spoiling the, the operation. But with this paper, as you can see here, it's working very smoothly. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So very cool. yeah, so that was more or less it. Uh, the lessons learned, just to, to close this, uh, do not assume easy steps. So I thought the, the things I thought it was easy weren't really easy. Um, plan the time for each phase and stick to it. Yeah, well, don't, don't, yeah, if, if you just devote like two weeks to, to model making, then just do it in two weeks and then move on because basically you then, you can simply spend like the whole time just doing one thing. Uh, start from the most problematic step that was for me a, a lifesaver and do not do it alone. I mean, that was a bad idea really to, even though I had help from, from, from my son and from my daughter who was annotating images. <laughs> really, that was the the other thing was uh, basically if I had another person on the team, we could really split the work much better, and it was it would be much more effective, and perhaps it could be done in a in a in a better way. Yeah, big shout out to both your son and daughter for helping you out in the project. Uh, their contribution is uh, you know much appreciated. 
Yeah, we'll have to make sure to um, to give them certificates when we do the top 10 finalist certificates, which I'm working on, so. <laughs> okay, very good, thank you. <laughs> I will surely pass it on. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, it was fun. Um, and thank you for my, for uh, the opportunity. It was really, it was really a, a good adventure and, the, and a lot of experience gained. It's our pleasure. Uh, should we go with? Uh, yeah, we can. We can only provide question? opportunities. Yeah, let's. Uh, so go, uh, Chris. Go ahead and unshare your screen if you don't mind. Sure. So I'm going to do uh, quickly here. Uh, I'm going to do our uh, teaser trailer first. Um, so oh. we're going to do our giveaway directly after what I'm about to show you, which is a teaser of the new virtual set that we've been working on with our friends at Light Twist. I know we've been talking about it on the show for a few weeks. And so uh, we thought we'd let you uh, kind of wet your whistle with a look around. It is uh, currently on YouTube. I'm posting the link in our chats and I'm about to share the video to everybody watching here live. All right, so I'm gonna hit the intro and then we'll... Uh... <laughs> Hey everybody, it's Phil Nelson here, the co-host with the co-most, and I'm here with the regular host with the regular most, Satya Malik. Satya, what do you think about this awesome virtual set we've got here with Light Twist? I think this is a great set, and I'm really excited to see uh, you know, this new virtual set. We had used this in uh, OpenCVI game show, but this is now going to become our regular feature in OpenCV Weekly webinar. I'm so excited uh, to see this uh, virtual set. And with us uh, in the studio is uh, Vikas Reddy, who is the right. creator of this virtual set. Vikas, uh, we'd love to have you here. A few thoughts, Good how thoughts. you built the set, and uh, you know, what do you think? Yeah, uh, really, really great to be here in the studio with you guys. Uh, yeah, it's been fun. Uh, the Light Twist team has been working really hard over the last couple of weeks to pull this together. It's we're actually streaming uh, from the cloud. So all of us are streaming up to a, a nice GPU server in the, in the cloud. We're running some nice segmentation, some different computer vision algorithms there. So a pretty cool combination of 3D graphics and, and computer vision that we pull together. Uh, and uh, yeah, the team is really excited to be uh, part of, participating in this with you guys, like helping power this experience. And super excited to see all the awesome guests you'll have over the next couple of weeks in this space on this very screen. Yeah, so you mentioned the cloud there. Does that mean I'm in the cloud? And if so, how do I get out of here? You're actually, uh, if you read the clause of the uh, the contract that we signed, you're actually uh, obligated to stay in the cloud uh, for at least another six, six to seven months. So Am I real? get comfy. Is any of this real? <laughs> <laughs> what about the cat? Is the cat real? The cat is, uh, yeah, it's a question. But you know, what is real? Uh, so next, uh, it's time for, let's do our giveaway. Thanks for sticking around here, everybody. Um, if this is your first time joining us, or if you just need a little reminder, I do every week, I ask a trivia question, which one lucky person in the audience wins something for this week, because it's an episode about OpenCV Spatial AI Contest. We will be giving away $200 of Microsoft Azure credits, thanks to our generous sponsor at Microsoft Azure on blazing Intel D4 hardware. If you have won in the last couple of months, please do not answer and give other people a chance to win. Get ready to answer here in the Zoom chat. Earlier, Chris talked about training models on Microsoft Azure and how fast and, and easy it was. About how long did he say it took to train his model on the Microsoft Azure wow, Custom Vision Service? <laughs> I had a streak of a couple of weeks of people, you know, being a little bit stumped, but they were just on that one. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the responses here. Bob Flynn is the most technically correct of the first uh, responders here. Daniel said one hour, Cruz said one hour, uh, Vaznath said one hour. The actual answer was less than one hour. 
Um, the answer, so uh, Bob Flynn, you have won some Microsoft Azure credits. Please send one email to phil at opencv.org and we'll make sure you get your Azure credits uh, pass. Let's move on to questions. Um, I have one some... more announcement yeah, before go ahead, course, uh, we yeah. go for the questions. So uh, Independence Day, we have a sale for our courses. So, okay. uh, you know, watch out for that. Uh, people who are interested in computer vision, deep learning, uh, these are the courses that OpenCV offers, and we have very few sale events uh, in a year, Independence Day, uh, Thanksgiving, um, the Black Friday sale, and maybe the New Year sale. So there are only a bunch of these. So if you're interested, please uh, watch out for uh, the newsletter email. Yeah, and, and space is always limited. It's first come, first serve, so you want to get in there quick to... Uh speed your speed your way through learning <laughs> um that's uh, opencv.org slash courses by the way moving on to questions from the audience here um for chris uh so um you noticed you uh, you mentioned you used mobile net uh, ssd mobile net v2 as your uh, detector did you mm -hmm. try other models other methods or did that one just happen to work out for you yeah i tried yolo uh, as a part of this uh, this um, mass production of models through through custom uh, vision and uh, mobile net just proved to be slightly better, mm -hmm. just performed slightly better. So the performance not, was better without losing any uh, uh, accuracy or or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the parameters accuracy were basically higher. I, I, you see the the, the I, in my opinion, the number of uh, sam image samples was not very high. So basically, mm. um, it, it it doesn't really. Um, I think the the what what would work best is to significantly significantly increase the the image samples. That would be the the main. Uh, way for me to to actually and the the, the mobile net or yolos was was basically a secondary uh, problem. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen would like to know what sort of challenges did you have with regards to labeling and annotation? I know you said your your daughter was helping out with that. Would you care to expand on uh, how that process worked for this project? Uh, yeah, the, the the problem. Uh, because we spent a little bit too much time on labeling and on basically training the model over the rocks themselves. Then when we got, I got panicked a little bit. So, so I need to switch to, to, to Lego bricks. And then we had this, uh, uh, well, we had to label this in a, in a rather short amount of time. So I could every, you know, all hands aboard. <laughs> so basically I, I needed all the help that, that uh, that I needed, and uh, it's actually uh, it's actually pretty easy to do in RoboFlow. In RoboFlow, it's it's um, the annotations are very uh, it kind of intelligently places the the annotation box uh, from one from one image to another, and it, it just goes very quickly. So um, yeah, my daughter was very fast with this as well, which was a great great experience for them as well. I think. Hopefully. <laughs> There's yeah, another great. question in the top, uh, Phil, you might have missed. Uh, mm. How many Lego Mindstorm kits did you need for this project? Was it a was it single kit sufficient? Yes. We used 85% more or less of the, uh, of the pieces from the set. Yes, that was question was from Kumar. Yeah. Um, yeah. Par would like to know a little bit more about vibrations and um mm -hmm. the speed the speed of the belt like did you change how, how did you zone in the the speed of your conveyor belt and also tell us a little bit more about how you managed to handle the vibrations and, and get past that mm -hmm. issue so as for speed as i said because we have no callbacks to verify whether what is the state of the engine what is the position of the engine we had to wait until the, the engine finishes its movement um, I had to put the uh, belt speed at almost the slowest possible uh, setting, which was 20. The, the whole, the whole uh, engine movement of steering is based on the, it, it's, it goes from 0 to 99. 
so 99 is the fastest, zero is stopped completely. And the because I had to put the objects on the belt uh, in a particular delay, uh, then the, the speed 20 was basically a fixed speed. So it, it, it was working best on this. 30 was already too fast. And 10 was really slow. I mean, 10 was like almost like a snail. So it would take forever for a, for a, a brick to travel. And as for uh, vibrations, uh, yeah, that was solved in, in two ways. First way was to completely rebuild the, uh, how to say, the legs of the model. So the, the pillars that it was basically standing upon. First, when the vibrations were very big, the, the legs were basically mostly diagonal, uh, sorry, vertical. Then we switched a little bit to, uh, to this diagonal shape a little bit. And uh, the, more, the more diagonal bars added between different parts, it, it kind of helped to support the vibrations uh, resistance. And then at the end, uh, perhaps it was uh, seen in, in some maybe images, there was a lead block uh, positioned on one engine. Uh, the, lead, the, lead, the pieces of lead basically taken from a model train. I disassembled model train, took this leg, of, which was very small, but very heavy and put it on one, on one engine. And it, and it like reduced the vibrations by maybe 50%. And it was already enough. The, the vibrations were still visible, but for cameras, it wasn't an, uh, an issue. That's great. I, I like the ingenuity there. You know, you use whatever you got to solve the problem. I like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so we're, we're uh, getting close to the time here. Chris, if, if folks want to follow you on, on the interwebs, um, you know, ask you questions, what is the, what's the best way for them to do that? I think the LinkedIn uh, profile would be the best uh, I am. Um, getting messages there on a daily basis. So th there was an, uh, there was a link there. Uh, yeah, the well, last... uh, I'll make sure I put it in the show notes there. Okay, yeah, please feel free to use it. Yeah, I'll be very happy to answer any questions if somebody has it, um, yeah, for the project. Awesome, yeah. Um, yeah. Next week, our guest mm -hmm. will be uh, Anna Petrovicheva again, talking about a very exciting new release from a model place which you may remember from an earlier episode of OpenCV Weekly Webinar. So look forward to that. There's been some, uh, there's some big changes coming over there, and it's a really exciting resource for stuff very much like this. Uh, Satya, you want to take us home? Yes, I want to thank Chris for joining us for the submission. And it's very motivating for people who are starting out to see such neat submission, such great presentation. So thank you for that. Uh, also want to thank you, Phil, for organizing this webinar and also the OpenCV Spatial AI competition. And thanks a bunch to our audience. Uh, we love you and it's great to see you every week. It keeps us motivated. So until <laughs> next week, adios. Absolutely. Thank thanks you. one more time to our generous sponsors at Microsoft Azure and Intel, or Intel and Microsoft Azure. See, I swapped I them around there. Um, <laughs> Take care of yourselves out there, folks. Take care of somebody else if you can. All right. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. This week's episode was brought to you by Intel and Microsoft Azure as part of OpenCV Spatial AI Contest. Follow along with the Oak D Light Contest hashtag. If you'd like to be in the audience next week, subscribe to the OpenCV newsletter.